The Auto Line Supplier Symposium is brought to you by our signature sponsor, Ford Motor Company, Go Further, and also by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Henkel, excellence is our passion. IAC Group, inspiration comes from within. And TI Automotive, fluid thinking. Hello and welcome to the second annual AutoLine Supplier Symposium, coming to you live from the 2014 North American International Auto Show. We're in the Ford display, an amazing thing that they've got here, and that's thanks to Ford being our signature sponsor for that event. We're going to be talking about all kinds of issues facing the supplier industry, and let me introduce you to my first two guests today. Hao Tai Tang is the head of purchasing for the Ford Motor Company. Michael Finney is the CEO of the Michigan uh, Economic Development Corporation. Great to have the both of you here with me. Michael, we'll bring you into the conversation in just a minute, but I, I got some questions that I'd like to ask to how to begin with for the show and how you're, you're brand new to the purchasing side of the business. You came up through engineering and product planning. You've got a quite a, an impressive promotion here to run all Ford purchasing, which does so much buying, I think, $100 billion a year. My first question to you is, what's new and different when you came to purchasing? What's happened that you did not expect? Well, John, first, it's a real honor to, to represent and serve the global purchasing team. You mentioned our, our, the scope and breadth of the job. I think the biggest surprise for me working in engineering was I had a lot of exposure to the production parts that we buy. I'm getting a lot more exposure to things like the tooling, the facilities, the services, consulting services, the ad agencies. Um, we really touch every element of the business all around the world, so that breadth of responsibility and learning about all those things beyond just the parts that go onto the vehicles has been a huge learning. One thing that I've always thought is good about being in purchasing is you get into every part of the company that way. Absolutely, yeah. We work with everybody. HR with uh, benefits that we purchase, uh, finance with consulting services, marketing with the ad buy, the ad agencies, the customer service like roadside assistance. So it touches every ele element of the business. I'm glad you mentioned it because a lot of people think, oh, purchasing, that's parts, components, and materials, but it's a lot more than that. Right. About 70% of our buy is with the production parts and then the other 30% is everything else. Now, as I said, you, or you just mentioned, there's things that were all new to you. What kind of opportunities do you see? Where, what kind of uh, ideas have you gotten since you took over this position? I think the greatest opportunity we have is uh, as much progress that we've made as a company was executing the one Ford plan. We think we have a lot more upside. And the biggest thing is, um, as a team, we've been able to deliver a lot of scale all around the world as we've rationalized our product complexity. And now we want to work and partner with our suppliers to, to leverage that value. Well, let, let's get into that. You know, as you mentioned, you're still in the, the process of commonizing platforms and processes worldwide. What kind of a role would you like suppliers to play in helping Ford achieve this one Ford goal? So as we um, simplify our product lineup and reduce the complexity, one of the things we're asking our suppliers to do is to help us strike the right value proposition. So part of that is looking at our, our manufacturing footprint and where can we consolidate our manufacturing footprint to enable more regional scale. A lot of it then is going into the supplier site and looking at their bill of process to extract the full value. Um, they're also helping us with a lot of benchmarking. We're engaging them much earlier and they're helping us benchmark other competitive designs and we're learning where we should have a where it makes more sense to have one global common design and where we should differentiate to be more in line with the customer's expectation and their willingness to buy. So th that's, a, that's a very important point, I think, that you just made, Hal. You're not trying to sell the exact same car everywhere in the world. You want to commonize as much as possible, but different tastes and regulations will change some of that. Absolutely, yeah. One Ford doesn't mean the same solution for every market. And as long as we have the regional scale that allows our suppliers to operate efficiently, we then have the opportunity to, to tailor the designs to better meet the needs of those consumers. So what are your top three priorities? Can I boil it down to something yeah. that simple? I think uh, this year for us, you can see our tremendous product lineup. We've got 23 global launches. So first and foremost, working with this, our suppliers to make sure we launch on time with quality. That's, that's paramount. Uh, number two is continuing to uh, leverage their innovation and new technologies. That's been a huge enabler for Jim Farley and his team to build up the Ford and Lincoln brands, so we want to continue that. And the last element, as I mentioned, is, is leveraging our scale and, and all of that uh, 
uh, scale around the world to extract the full value out of one Ford. So those are the key, three key priorities for us. How you've talked before about the aligned business framework at Ford, uh, that you work with your top suppliers. Tell us about the long-term goals of that program and, and what that term means. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's an established framework of how we want to work together. And it's uh, a set of mutual expectations between the suppliers and Ford, and it's all around trust, collaborate, collaboration, communication, and integrity. And by doing that, we've created long-term strategic partnerships with 100 key suppliers. Um, and it's really helped us. You think about the crisis that we've been through. You think about um, the help that they've given us in terms of production shortages because of natural disasters like the tsunami. Um, you think about getting our global suppliers to invest in new markets like India and Russia and South America along with us. All of those things would not be possible without this, this partnership. So we think it's a huge enabler for us to build this uh, long-term relationship and it's been a big uh, enabler for us to get access to new technologies. And I, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, what Jim's been able to do with to communicate things like EcoBoost, for example, to help polish our brand, uh, has translated into improving our pricing power. So it really helps every element of the business. The other thing we're finding is our suppliers are all in a different place now. They're all much stronger. They've gone through similar restructuring, and they're being much more selective about who they want to work with. Uh, and we want to be their partner of choice. The latest uh, supplier OEM relationship survey by Automotive News just came out and Ford was ranked number two in the world. Uh, it wasn't very long ago when we were at the bottom of the list. So a lot of progress, but we're, we're, we want to you know, continue to improve. There's a lot of talk at this show about light weighting, about connected cars. As you get into these things and as different suppliers are listening to this program, what's the message that you want to send to them specifically about these topics? Light weighting and you got the, the brilliant lightweight F-150 behind us here too. Yep. So what are you telling suppliers in terms of the technology you'd like to see them bring to you? I think a couple of key messages. One is Ford is really uh, actively seeking out new innovations, but we want it to be aligned with our brand pillars. Having that clarity around safe, smart, green, and quality for the Ford brand, for example, helps our suppliers figure out where they should invest and in which technologies. The second one is when we find uh, promising new technology, new innovation, we go big and we deploy it broadly across our portfolio and we put our marketing might behind it. So I mentioned EcoBoost, two million EcoBoost engines. It's available on 80% of our global volume. So suppliers know that if they find a solution that Ford wants, we will put our, our, our efforts behind it to make it uh, an attractive business firm. So uh, we really uh, want our suppliers to continue to help us. Just keep it focused on our brand positioning, our brand pillars, and we'll help them bring it to business and, and make it a commercial success. I like the plan, and I got to believe suppliers are excited to be working with Ford on this, too. Well, let's bring Michael Finney into the discussion here. And Michael, as you remember, exactly a year ago, on this very program, you announced the Pure Michigan Business Connect, where you're connecting different companies in Michigan with one another. In fact, how I think you've got an announcement, uh, or you both do, on what came out of that program. Yeah, we, we're delighted to partner with Michael and, and the MEDC, and you mentioned this summit. We called it uh, the Pure Michigan uh, Business Connect uh, Summit, and it was a, a matchmaking summit. It was like speed dating, right, Michael? We, we took uh, the Ford purchasing teams, our buyers, along with our top 30 tier one suppliers, and the goal was to partner them with local Michigan businesses. And as a result of that, that uh, conference, a collaboration in March, we're proud to announce that we've identified uh, 10 million plus dollars of incremental businesses that source to local uh, Michigan business. And this is incremental to the $15 billion of turnover that we currently do with Michigan-based businesses. So it's a great story for the economy. Well, and John, the significance of it is that you know, through Pure Michigan Business Connect, I mean, we're a state entity and we're helping facilitate business to business connections. And that's a very unusual uh, uh, tactic for an economic development organization. We typically give away tax credits and things like that. But we've discovered that by, in order to be really business friendly, we need to be responsive to every request that we get. And it wasn't uncommon for us to get requests from businesses who wanted to have access to Ford or Chrysler or, or DTE Energy and so many other large established companies. 
And what we've been able to do now through Pure Michigan Business Connect is create those access opportunities in a very seamless way. We pre-qualify all the companies based on needs that corporations like Ford identify. And then through that pre-qualification process, we're able to bring them together through a summit or in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And, and it hopefully results in commitments like the $10.4 million that Ford announced today, which is a great opportunity for us. That's significant, and Michael, I know you've got some sort of uh, sliding rule of scale that X amount of dollars creates X amount of jobs. Well, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's not just our rule of thumb. It, it really is some fact-based data that comes from the federal government. The U.S. Department of, uh, of, of the, the military, actually, or defense, uses a number of roughly $200,000 for every new job. And so if a company gets 200,000 of new business, that's one job. Uh, so $10 million equals 500 new jobs that are gonna be created by companies here in the state of Michigan. And it's all because two companies decided to work together. And that's a, a great outcome. Oh, that's a very powerful statement that you have a meeting where people get together and you generate over $10 million of business. That's, that's really impressive. It is. But I guess I gotta ask how, you, you've got this great purchasing organization, far flung global, and yet you need these kinds of uh, operations to, to discover new suppliers right in your neighborhood, so to speak. Yeah, and, and it's, I, I think that's what's great about the, the workshop is a lot of these suppliers just need an opportunity and they need an opportunity to showcase what they can do. And uh, through this program, we've had a thousand people apply with 7,000 different ideas. So through that process was how we were able to generate it. And it, it really, it provides the opportunity to people that may normally not, not get a chance to get their foot in the door. So will you continue it? I, I mean, as the head of Ford Purchasing, you like this idea? We do. Uh, we think it's important to introduce new suppliers to the supply base. It creates competition. It continues the wheels of progress and ensures that everybody is working uh, to improve. That's an important point, right, Michael, that it's not just Ford doing it, it's Ford suppliers are participating in this. We, John, we have more than 10,000 suppliers in our Pure Michigan Business Connect database. And it's everything from companies that make baked goods who want to sell to a Ford's cafeteria, to obviously uh, folks who provide production materials to support Ford's ongoing operations. And everything in between. We have uh, several, uh, I don't want to say tens of companies that are on the buy side, but we have thousands of companies on the sales side who are actively participating in the program. Uh, 2013 was in round numbers about $1.5 billion of B2B activity that was facilitated. So when you start doing the numbers, a billion dollars of B2B activity represents about 5,000 jobs. Uh, so there's an awful lot of job creation activity that's happening as a result of this with key partners in addition to Ford, like Chrysler, uh, DTE Energy, Consumers Energy, and so many others that are actively participating in the program and creating literally you know, billions of dollars of opportunity for Michigan-based suppliers. I've got to believe other states are looking at what you're doing here, Michael, and going, hey, wait a minute, we can do that too. Have you heard of anybody else picking up on this idea? Well, we're an early adopter of this approach. And so there is something to be said for being an early adopter, you get that advantage. But we also know that we have to continue to reinvent the way we do economic development, the way we support businesses. So we're always looking for our new and better ways to move forward with a program like Pure Michigan Business Connect. And we will come out with better ideas, better approaches down the road. And we won't tip our competition off to those. Okay. I was just going to ask you, like what? But well, one example. There are great organizations in our state like Inforum that's, that really focuses on helping women businesses thrive. There's organizations like the Michigan Minority Supplier Development Council, headed up by Lewis Green, that's helping with the disadvantaged business pipeline. Well, we're actually working in partnership with organizations like that to really private label our products so that they become the face of Pure Michigan Business Connect and they can sell it to their clients the same way we sell it to businesses on a statewide basis. Those are just some examples of, of projects that we're working on. They're not done yet, but we expect to be able to deliver this program via other partners in a very seamless way, as one example. That's great. I love hearing that you're creating more jobs in the state. How I love hearing the story about how Ford's working with the supplier community to continue to grow. I want to thank you both for kicking off the Autoline Supplier Symposium this year. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. And uh, we'll be back in just a minute. We're going to switch in our next panel talking about all kinds of things, but we've got a few things for you to look at in the meantime. There's so much to love about Bridgestone's Dueler tires. The amazing traction, the quiet, comfortable ride, and they're really tough. It's like loving three tires in one. 
Joining me right now is the chairman and chief executive officer of TI Automotive, Bill Kazira. Bill, great having a, a chance to talk with you again. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. How's business going? Well, how's the business the... Is, is doing uh, very well. 2013 has turned out to be just a wonderful year, I think, for not only the auto industry, but, but for TI Automotive as well. And uh, we're very happy to uh, look forward into 2014, which we think will be another great year. Okay, tell us about the products that are driving that growth. Yeah, well, for TI Automotive, we're experts in fuel systems and anything that handles the fluid on the automobile, whether it's the storage of the fluid, the delivery of the fluid, or the carrying of the fluid. So um, we, we think as ourselves as being experts in, in, in automotive fluids. And the products for those are evolving now that there's an increased focus on improved fuel economy and reduced emissions. And so we are introducing uh, new products such as our new fuel tank, which uh, is, we call it the TAPT Tank Advanced Process Technology Fuel Tank, uh, which is a automotive news pace finalist for 2014. And so we're keeping our fingers crossed, hoping that uh, we may be successful there come come April time frame. But what's unique about the fuel tank is that we're able to blow mold the tank as one piece and as part of the manufacturing process uh, before the plastic is completely solidified we open the mold about an inch we can cut the two halves apart and we can actually insert components inside the tank. Like what kind of components? Everything from some of the venting valves uh, and the components that are normally external to the fuel tank but for example we can also insert baffles that will allow the fuel tank to be quieter to prevent sloshing of the fuel as these vehicles are becoming quieter and quieter through the additional uh, acoustic uh, improvements in the car, as well as, as well as with hybrid electric vehicles. When you're in, you're in the electric mode, uh, the vehicle is very quiet and you can hear things that you wouldn't normally hear. So uh, we're pretty excited. That product is introduced for the first time this year, 2014, with Mercedes on the S-Class. And so we're all proud and excited to have that new technology introduced in the auto industry. So you, you, you mold the tank, then you cut it, open it up, put these things inside, and what, just seal it back up again? Yeah, so we have about 54 seconds uh, to seal these two halves back together. And uh, the two halves are, in essence, fused. Uh, as though they were never cut to begin with. And so there's no subsequent assembling of these two halves. And so it's a, uh, it's a unique process that uh, actually we have a tremendous amount of interest from the car industry, the automobile manufacturers, to bring to other platforms to capitalize on the whole improvement uh, around reduced emissions. And so um, it's the next generation of what we call zero emission fuel tanks. And so we introduced back in 2006 our so-called chip in the bottle technology that we introduced with, uh, for example, BMW for the 3 Series for those vehicles sold in the state of California. That was where we inserted internally through the Parison as we were molding the tank, the internal components. Um, and the trick at the end of the day is to have fewer um, areas where you cut the tank to actually uh, insert components or have leak paths of these hydrocarbons by virtue of cutting the tank for sub-assembly work. So. Amazing to see so much technology just going into the fuel tank. Yes. Just, just extraordinary. Bill, as you know, this segment showing during the North American International Auto Show, your thoughts about the show? Well, I'm pretty excited uh, about the auto industry in general. And this show here in Detroit, of course, is one of the top five uh, in the world. And uh, for me, being my hometown, I'm uh, proud to be able to uh, see that Detroit still has what it takes. and. Uh, uh, certainly the show will demonstrate a lot of the new technology and styling and new vehicles. Uh, for TI Automotive, we have one of our products on about two-thirds of the vehicles made globally around the, uh, the industry. And so we have many products on the floor, not only fuel tanks, but braking fuel lines and our new brushless fuel pumps, for example, as well as some of the new uh, heating and cooling um, and ventilation components to heat and cool passenger compartments, engines, transmissions, or in the case of electric vehicles, we're now cooling the battery supply pack with uh, a water cooling system or a jacket, in essence, that goes around the, um, the energy source for electric cars. So as you go through the show, it's not just all this pretty sheet metal. You love seeing all these vehicles with your technology. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have the ability to see through the sheet metal and see the interior <laughs> components that the average consumer doesn't get a chance to see. But uh, there's a lot of technology in these vehicles, and uh, the vehicles are getting better and better every year. They're more fuel efficient, and of course, um, the emission levels are coming down in big leaps uh, and steps 
um, which is which is good for for the world at the end of the day. And it's uh, I think an important role that the audience journey has demonstrated that uh, we too can focus on reducing emissions. Real good, Bill Kazira. Thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Welcome back to the AutoLine Supplier Symposium, coming to you live from the floor of the 2014 North American International Auto Show. We're in the Ford display now during the media, or I shouldn't say media, the preview days, where all different kinds of people from the industry come in to look at what's at the auto show here. But we're now going to get to our first panel discussion, which was organized by the OESA, the Original Equipment Supplier Association. And joining me right now are Lori Harbor, the CEO of Harbor Results, Daryl Adams, the CEO of Midway Products, and Delco Prebeg, the CEO of Omega Products. And we're here because Lori did a study last year that showed there could be some tooling issues facing the North American auto industry. In fact, some pretty serious ones. Lori, just give us a quick thumbnail of what your results turned up there. Sure. Well, as evidenced by the show today, I mean, there's a lot of great new vehicles out here. There's a lot of great new technology that's being launched. Every automaker is launching new vehicles, and all those tools, all of those vehicles require tools as well as the technology. So as we all charge after this 20 million unit um, production volume by 2020, there, all these new vehicles are requiring tooling. And so in the current space of, of our tooling industry in North America, the industry's never seen volumes of that size. And so our study showed kind of what is happening in terms of current spending within the industry, where we expect it to go, how LCC sourcing plays into that, and, and ultimately provided best practices for these companies to improve their business. So Daryl, you've seen the study, right? I mean, what, what's your take on what Lori turned up here? John, the information that Lori presented uh, is, is outstanding. Uh, we're using that data, trying to understand it, and it correlates with what we've been seeing when we try to source tools, low-cost country sourcing. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, it's right on. Yeah, and same question there. Delco, what do you think of, what, what's your take from that study? Well, again, like Daryl mentioned, we do see a significant increase in the amount of uh, tooling that's necessary based upon the releases that are pending coming forward. Uh, we also see a lot of plastics being introduced as lightweighting initiatives are being uh, introduced into a lot of the vehicles from a fuel efficiency standpoint. So, uh, yeah, we see quite a bit, quite a bit more uh, business than we did 10 years ago. But, Lori, your, your study really showed there's probably going to be a shortage that automakers are not going to be able to get the tooling that they need to get to this, this production level that you're talking about. Right, it, it really documented about a $6 billion difference in where we are today as to where we think it's going. And so the OEMs have a big challenge on their hands to balance how do they source those tools, where do they source them, and more importantly, how do they collaborate with both tier ones and tool suppliers to work together at solving this problem. So it's a very important initiative at every one of the OEMs today. So uh, you two represent tooling companies. How do you deal with this? It's a great opportunity, I imagine, but one that you're going to have, probably have to struggle with as well. John, we, we've been meeting with our customers, uh, all of them, talking about the tooling, the benefits of offshoring, the total land of cost that Lori's study showed. Um, the gap is closing due to the increased labor costs offshore. Um, so it is becoming a challenge. It could be, North America could be the low cost tooling source. Eventually, when you look at the total cost of, of the landed tool, um, then you have the, the cost to maintain the tool when you're in production. Uh, different steels than we're used to in North America. So it, it is challenging, but I think as long as you keep the, the dialogue open with your, your customers um, and work with the tool shops, it, we'll get through it. It's uh, just another challenge. We had a couple tough years in 08 and 09. We got through that challenge, and this is just another hurdle we have to get over. But like Lori said, if we work together, it's possible. Delco, do you see automakers more interested in sourcing tooling in the U.S. or certainly North America rather than offshoring it? I guess it would depend upon the commodity. Uh, at Omega Tool, we focus very much on medium to larger size tooling, uh, where I believe that there may be some challenges as far as offshoring to LCC from a total cost of ownership or landed cost. Um, 
at Omega, we've worked very hard to be able to improve our uh, initial throughput. Uh, therefore, by increasing our efficiency, it provides us the opportunity to take on more business with less or maximize the utilization of our resources. Another push over the last uh, a uh, couple years, few years that has been since the recession period, there's been a very strong desire by OEMs, tier ones, and the tooling facilities to really work together in the initial development phases in order to be able to develop a product that's correct the first time through to minimize that time and cost and reduce the cost. Corey, one of the things that you turned up in your uh, survey too is that there can even be a question, who owns the tools? Is it the tooling company that developed it? Is it the supplier that's going to use it? Or is it the automaker that ultimately needs the parts that comes out of those tools? How's this being resolved? Or is it still an issue? Well, it really hasn't changed over the years. To be honest, it was probably much more of an issue 10 or 15 years ago when OEMs were moving tools and, and taking parts from suppliers and having that flexibility. Today, we don't see it as big of an issue anymore. Um, the fact is the OEM owns the tool. They just do. The problem is, or not the problem, but the, the fact is that the tier one has to run the part. So, and the tool supplier has to make that tool. So the, the most important thing is that the tool supplier can make a cost effective tool, that that tier one can run it at the right cycle time to, to get the right cost. And ultimately that the OEM has great quality parts. And so the ownership issues become a little bit less of a concern. Uh -huh. Do you see it that way, Daryl? Too? Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> the OEM customer owns the tools, as Lori said, at Midway Products, we're responsible to maintain that tool, high quality, still produce a high quality part. So if we break the tool, it's our, we're obligated to fix it, keep it at the same level as when it made the first part. Do you see differences between the different automakers, though, well, domestics much, versus the foreign? It's, it's pretty it's much pretty the same, at least our customers we deal with. Same with you, Delco? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. The uh, OEM, regardless of who it is, is ultimately the owner of the tool at the end of the day. Uh -huh. Uh, Lori, too, you, you raised a great question uh, about how these tooling suppliers should be paid. Because my understanding right now is they don't get paid until they've actually made the tool. Run, run us through that so the audience understands how that all works. Well, typically, the payment terms that are standard among all the OEMs and frankly among the tier ones is, is at PPAP, which is essentially when you approve the part and it's ready to go to mass production. So a tool supplier can be kicked off 16, 18 months before that, that date, and they have to fund that tool themselves. And ultimately, they finance the tool, and they roll that into their price of, of that tool to the OEM. So you know, somebody has to finance the cost of the tool. That, that just happens, because you have a anywhere between 12 and 4, 24 month period of time. The, the, the challenge here is that for a privately held tool supplier of 20 or 30 million, they're borrowing money at, you know, six, seven, eight percent. OEMs are borrowing money at like two percent. So if we could get the OEMs to, you know, share some of that burden and, and provide some form of payment terms throughout the process, it improves their cash flow. It allows them to continue to reinvest in their business. Lowers the price of the tool. And lowers the price of the tool. That's right. Okay, so what's happening? Are the automakers open to this? Have you guys heard any interest in automakers or suppliers sharing the, the tooling cost as you go along rather than you only getting paid at the end? It, uh, for Midway, we buy the tools, we don't make them. Okay. So we try to get the best cost and we take, you know, if we can get progress payments, we'll take them, but that could give the OEM a better price but we just pass it on through. So the, the real difficulty comes when the tool shops, like Lori said, two years out buying material and they don't get paid for two years. Delco can probably tell you the, the, the amount or the percentage that they're paying to fund that money over two years. There's a lot of, there's a lot of variation uh, within the industry. There's a lot of interest in being able to improve uh, those types of terms. Uh, I guess much depends on the status of the company or the size of the company, as Lori had mentioned previously, on their ability to be able to finance uh, that types of tooling. Um, so we end up uh, being able to work uh, with our customers, and a lot depends on your relationship, and ultimately, the quality of your product at the end of the day, it really dictates uh, final initiation of payment. So the better quality product that we produce, better throughput, the quicker to market, ultimately, we get paid faster. And John, it's improving. 
It is improving. And that capacity issue that we have, that's how the OEMs will capture capacity in guys like Delco. They'll give him progress payments, and he's going to choose that OEM over somebody who's not. So <laughs> it'll be used as a lever to gain that capacity. So in a way, not having so much tooling capacity is a benefit to the tool makers who are there. You're, you're a little bit more in the driver's seat. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily driver's seat. Again, we, st we still work uh, very much in conjunction with the tier one and the OEM. Uh, definitely don't want to be perceived as taking advantage, but, but there are there are opportunities for us to be able to improve so that we have the ability to be able to take on more of the, more of the work and maintain it domestically. Did, does this vary by automaker then too? Uh, or can you say they're all interested in making payments along the way? They're all very interested in it right now. They all right now have standard terms of that PPAP date, but they're all looking at changes to that. And probably the most interesting is the foreign companies, because if you if you look at how they buy their tools today for a Honda or a BMW, those companies are still buying a lot of tools, not in China, but in their homeland, so Germany or Japan. As they do more engineering and design work here, and as they grow their models, they have to localize tooling because they can't afford going back and forth overseas. So, so you're seeing them, the, the reason for that growth and capacity that we're forecasting is those guys are going to insource more to North America and they need tool capacity. Okay, Daryl, you sell tools. Do you see that happening, that uh, the offshore companies are, are looking to source more of their tooling in the U.S.? Absolutely. And it's, it's better for the U.S. economy. And I think that's part of their objective. But you also keep the currency fluctuation out of it. Currency can move a lot, a lot over two years. So if they can source it now, price it now, they don't have to worry about it. Of the currency, it's fixed. And, and we do see additional volume from all the OEMs coming back onto the, the U.S. shoreline. Same question, Delco. Uh, you, you're getting more business, are you, from uh, the foreign-based companies? Oh, absolutely. We see a lot of we see a lot of uh, business from the new domestics coming. We currently produce a lot of manufacture uh, manufacture a lot of tools for uh, European uh, OEMs. Uh, we see a lot of a uh, lot of uh, I guess investment in the southern United States, obviously in Mexico, uh, a lot of announcements coming in. So we're doing what we can in order to be able to uh, maintain and increase our, our, our uh, exposure, I guess, to not only the domestic OEMs, but also to the new domestics as well. This panel, in fact, was uh, thought up by the Original Equipment Supplier Association, the OESA, which represents suppliers. What role can they play in this, Lori? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, OESA has taken a very active role in the tooling industry, which a lot of people haven't in the past. And so in uh, 2012, they started the OESA Tooling Forum, which is essentially a group of business leaders that all own tool shops that get together and talk about how do they improve their business? What can they control that they can get better at? And that really is how our tooling study was born. Through that forum, they said, hey, we want to do benchmarking. We want to study this whole value stream of tooling. So that was how we got partnered with OESA and facilitating both that and the, the tooling study. And so their, their focus right now, along with working with us, is how do we elevate these issues in such a way that we can all collectively kind of attack the problem and be able to meet the demand. Our, our theory is if we work together, we can solve you know, a lot of those open capacity issues. And, and probably the one other thing we haven't mentioned that's so critical to capacity is the issue of labor and the skilled trade gap. And tooling is probably the worst, although every, I mean, Daryl can tell you, even in production suppliers, we're struggling to get people, but there's not a lot of people who say, I want to go in the trade of making a tool. The perception of that is, is not so strong within our elementary or our high schools. And so collectively, we have to attack that problem. OEMs are going to make tools because they're going to make vehicles. And they're going to come from somewhere. So if we can't provide the labor and develop the next generation, it's a capacity constraint. So, Daryl, you must have been involved in some of these OESA discussions, I imagine. Yes, we, were, we took part in the study. What would you like to see the OESA doing? Uh, I think the OESA, by doing the study with the Harbor Group and its current suppliers, production and toolmakers, they've kicked it off. They got it rolling. It's going to, I think, need to be guided a little bit, um, but it, it's, it's already moving fast. Um, but to get back to one of Lori's points, we do struggle finding toolmakers. 
Um, I think the, the STEM uh, initiative that's going on in North America is, is going to help, but that's going to take a few years. So there's, a, there's some gap that we need to fill quickly. At Midway, we started apprentice programs at each of our plants, trying to get some people that are interested, if they're a production worker, they want to become a tool maker, we'll help them through it as long as they can continue to you know, get good grades and, and walk through the program. They can be a, a tool maker when they get done. It's going to take a few years, but we weren't finding them even out to, to employ, so we basically are creating our own. Delco, how are you dealing with this? I got to imagine being a uh, machine tool maker play, pays pretty good money. You know, I don't think that anybody really complains about standard of living uh, from a tool making standpoint. Um, at Omega Tool, again, one of, the, one of the things that we try to focus on is working very diligently with our secondary and post-secondary institutions that are around us as well in conjunction with some of the government uh, programs that are going on. Uh, internally, we have a development plan for either students and or young adults that want to enter the industry. Uh, we host uh, a series of uh, open houses, uh, again, with, the, with these facilities to be able to introduce people into uh, our environment to remove that perception that it's a dirty uh, type of uh, business and, and show them exactly what it is. That uh, it's, a, it's very uh, technologically orientated, uh, very precise um, orientated business and, and there's no, room, no margin for error uh, in, what, in what we do. Um, you know, one of the other opportunities that we're also uh, looking at exploring is the ex-military. Um, you know, they have a very strong work ethic, the uh, discipline is already there, and uh, they have a strong desire to learn. And those, those are very sought after uh, characteristics that we're looking for within, within our business. That's a great story. I love hearing this. I love hearing that you did the study and that the industry is focused on what could be an issue and especially love what you guys are saying about how you can create more jobs and especially with some of our veterans on Absolutely. that. I want to thank all three of you for having come in. Lori Harbour, Daryl Adams, and Delco Preberg, thanks for taking part in this panel discussion. Thank you, thank you very much, Andre. We're going to get the next panel already here, but we got something else for you to take a look at in the meantime. Henkel, the global leader in adhesive technologies. At Henkel, we provide value for customers with innovative and sustainable technologies. Our global reach means we're always close to our customers wherever they are. Our expert market knowledge allows us to anticipate trends and to propose the best solutions whatever the industry. You can find our solutions everywhere. We are ready to take adhesive technologies to the next level. Joining me in the studio right now is Michael Martini, the president of OE Sales at Bridgestone Americas, and Mike, great seeing you as always. It's always great to be with you, John. Bridgestone's doing some interesting things on sustainability, and you're working on some interesting materials, but I want you to tell the audience about this. You know, a lot of people talk about sustainability, but, you know, I think at Bridgestone, we're trying to take it to the next level. You know, we're talking about, you know, not only biodiversity, which is, you know, being in tune with the nature, but also we're trying to get to a place where we have totally sustainable materials, 100%. So the entire product is sustainable. So you're, you're growing agricultural products, you know, those kinds of things. Because tires are highly uh, petrochemical intensive right now, right? Absolutely. You know, only about 25% of the tire is, is a renewable resource, and that is the natural rubber part. You know, we, we have farms around the world producing natural rubber. Well, that's a great model now to continue right on down the stream. So talk about what, what are some of the materials you're looking at putting in these tires that are sustainable? You know, just in the last six months, we opened up a new farm of a new bush of Waiuli, which is this cute little bush that actually produces a polymer-like uh, uh, material that we'll be able to use in tires. So say the word again. It's Waiuli. Waiuli. 
Okay, never heard of that plant yep, before. Yep, yep, And we've got a kind of a, so that's actually going into, you know, first commercialization. Uh, we've got another research project, and I know it's one of your favorite, a Russian dandelion that we're working with Ohio State University on. What do you mean Russian dandelion? What, yeah. What's the matter with American or other uh, dandelions? You know, we actually went through, you know, understanding, you know, all the different products that can produce latex type material. And Russian dandelions have really long roots. And the roots actually have a latex type material. So those are polymers for the future. So that's where we're going. So sustainability, it's not easy to get there. And sustainability being, of course, not just how the tires perform, but how they're manufactured and recycled, right? Yeah, that's really an important point because, you know, our goal, and it's really attainable, you know, by 2020, we expect to reduce by 35% the carbon footprint from our manufacturing of the tires all the way through the life cycle of the tire and then the reuse of the tire at the end, whether it be fuel or um, you know actual reuse of the product. 35% reduction by 2020, that's, that's right around the corner. Yeah, it's huge. Now we started that's based on 2005, so we're, we're already well into this uh, and, and we see that we're gonna meet that goal. You know, and the OEs need that and you and I need that because it's all about fuel economy. It's all about getting to that 54 and a half for 2025 and the tire industry represents a huge part of making that happen. Now, when you talk about sustainability, you, you've got this 35% reduction right. or 35% reduction in CO2 uh, or carbon footprint. W what's the end goal? Where, where, what's the ultimate vision then? Okay, so we go by 2050, we want to have really on the material side, 100% you know, sustainable. So that's one part. And, and we know that, you know, right now we got a, what, about one billion cars. By 2050, our sh numbers show there'll be two billion cars on the planet, nine billion people. So, you know, it's all about, you know, we're gonna have to have a protection of the resources. So that's where the sustainability comes in. And we're really dedicated to get there. I know it's a long-term goal, but, you know, you have to start now. These are kinds of technologies that you just don't develop overnight, as you can imagine. Uh, no, as, as I well know, no, that's uh, really impressive. To be able to literally grow your raw material is, uh, that's got to be almost as sustainable as it gets. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, it's all through the whole manufacturing process. One of the things we're really proud of is, you know, we're, we're, we're actually already there. We have a number of plants that are zero landfill. And so we're going to have some uh, big announcements here and probably in the first quarter, you know, talking about how many plants Bridgestone already have that are zero landfill. So that's a part of the pie as well. That's pretty impressive. I've heard of automated having assembly plants that are zero landfill, but to have a tire manufacturing plant make the same claim, that it's a first to me. I've not heard of this before. Yeah, it's, it's, going, to be a, it's going to be huge. And, you know, um, uh, tire manufacturing, as you know, but our audience probably doesn't know, it's, it's, a, it's a huge chemical facility. You know, it's usually more than one million square feet under roof. Those are the kinds of, uh, of manufacturing that we have. Well, Michael Martini, what a great message you're bringing on sustainability. Very impressive. Thanks, John. My dad had a Honda. My mom had a Honda. I was coming from a 2007 Honda Accord. I traded it for a Ford Fusion Titanium. I kind of was indifferent toward Ford, and then I sat in the Fusion for the first time, and I was just like, wow, you have the power, but you have the fuel economy. That's what EcoBoost does. I love to tell people, look at what Ford has to offer. Make the switch to Ford Fusion. Get 0% financing for 60 months and $500 switch bonus cash. See your local Ford dealer today. Welcome back to the AutoLine Supplier Symposium, coming to you live from the 2014 North American International Auto Show. It's the preview days for the people in the industry who are down here. We're in the Ford display area and they're mobbing this place, coming in to take a look at the new Mustang, the new F-150, that aluminum intensive one. 
and, and the other vehicles that they've got here. But now it's time for our next panel discussion, which has actually been organized by the Canadian Consulate here in the Detroit area, because there's a lot of innovation coming out of Canada. Joining us for today's panel are Linda Hassenfrantz, the CEO of Linamar, Steve Rogers, the president of the Automotive Parts Manufacturing Association in Canada, and Swami Katagiri, the chief technology officer for Magna International and Kwame. I, I, Swami, I understand you just got that title. You're a brand new CTO. Exactly, and what a way to introduce it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm glad I was able to do so. Thank you. Linda, so much of this show that I'm hearing about from the automakers is light waiting. Here we are in the Ford display. They're talking about their aluminum pickup. They've taken over 700 pounds out of it. But I know Linamar is working on a lot of things in the powertrain area and others to make them more lightweight, but can you give us some examples of some of the more exciting things that you've got going? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, clearly, lightweighting is, uh, is a clear priority uh, in terms of improving fuel efficiency. So uh, a few of the things that, that we're working on, uh, on the engine side, for instance, camshafts, uh, we have wait, a couple. Wait, go back. Camshafts. How are you making camshafts more lightweight? Well, uh, by uh, the process by which you make them, actually. It's a little bit design and a little bit process innovation. We've got a couple of plants in Germany that are hydroforming camshafts, which uh, take significant weight out because you're using a hollow tube and then pressing the lobes uh, on in, in uh, while well, using a hydroforming process. Uh, and as a result, you can save 60 to 70 percent of the weight of a camshaft. Uh, and you know, That's in crazy uh, weight saving, 60 uh, to 70 percent. Absolutely, and and don't forget, uh, in uh, depending on the engine configuration, you might have four camshafts uh, in that engine. So it, it all adds up and can offer some significant weight savings. Unbelievable. Swami, talk a little bit about what uh, Magna International is doing, and especially as the chief technology officer, what are you looking into as far as light weighting goes? Yeah, I think we have four uh, pillars of innovation at Magna. We call them safer, cleaner, smarter, and light, lighter. So if you look at the lightweight side of things, uh, based on our product portfolio, we do the body and chassis system, we do powertrain components, uh, drive line, you know, uh, seating, uh, interiors and exteriors. So, uh, our light weighting efforts actually kind of cut across different products. So in some cases, it's different types of metals. Uh, for example, the, the talk today is aluminum, and we're also looking in some of our research centers for magnesium. Actually, one of the key things we're working along with the U.S. Department of Energy uh, and the province of Ontario and our OEM partner Ford on a multi-material lightweight vehicle of the future using aluminum, magnesium, composites, and so on and so forth. As Linda mentioned, though, it's, it's not just the materials, it's the process, too. And isn't Magna into this hot stamping that I hear so much about going on in the industry now? Absolutely. I think there is a lot of process in innovations. One of them happens to be hot stamping. It's been there, but there's a lot of process innovation to reduce cycle time. Uh, how do you build the tools? How do you cool uh, the part faster when you're making it? So there is significant amount of uh, innovation to reduce post-processing. You know, we make the part, you have to trim and pierce and cut the part. How do you do it without you know, going into so much detail? Uh, we do the same thing in cycle time reduction of aluminum castings. We talk about aluminum quite a bit. Uh, we have a lot of initiatives in doing uh, aeronautics grade aluminum alloys for automotive. We've been able to bring a couple of them into production, and there is a couple more coming into production. Great. Steve, now i got to get to you, because we've been talking light weighting, and we'll talk some other topics uh, with Linda and Swami, but I know one thing that you're keen to talk about is this connected car technology, and there's especially some work going on with Toyota in Canada in that regard. Fill us in on the details. Well, Toyota has been good enough to give us a uh, Lexus RX350. One of the things that we find with connected car technologies, a lot of the suppliers are smaller. They don't have the wherewithal to make a, a prototype that an OEM would expect to see, or they're from an industry outside the automotive industry because it may be aerospace, it may be software, where a lot of these technologies are coming from, they don't know what the OEM expects. So we're taking this vehicle, we've invited 15 suppliers, and we're going to integrate all of their technologies onto this RX350, and we'll take it around to the OEMs to be able to showcase Canadian technology, these breakthrough innovative uh, concepts, 
and they will be able to see a full working prototype, how it works in with the CAN bus architecture and everything else, much better than just a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I can imagine it would be better than just a PowerPoint. Can you give us some ideas? Do you know of any of these technologies that might be going in the car? There's a, it goes from the very simple. Uh, it will include a Qi-enabled wireless technology charging, so it's not just that the, your smartphone connects Bluetooth, but in order to integrate all of the features of, a, uh, of a, the 4G uh, technology or interface that we're going to need, so you will have wireless charging so that the moment you put your phone down, it's not just uh, Bluetooth connected, it's charging, but we also have, for example, sensors that you take a look at the back of a fascia of a vehicle, it's got those little uh, round circles that have to be installed, painted, color matched. We've now got uh, sensor technology that can see through steel so that you can put those, sec those sensors all the way around the vehicle, but you can put it in the body in white. You're not putting something in the door, which allows you to have a much better range or understanding of all of the uh, surroundings of a vehicle that make an autonomous car possible. So it's all of those technologies. How did you find these 15 different companies? How'd that all come together? And basically, we simply go out, we try and talk to our supplier community, we make it known, uh, you know, these are the connected car uh, technologies where we're going, this is what it's going to take for convergence to lead to an autonomous car. You simply go out, make it known, and all of a sudden these companies start showing up out of the woodwork, if you will. They call us and say, oh, we've got this, we think it could be. It's oftentimes about convergence, it's about bringing technologies, matching companies together to get what the future technology requirements will be. Is Toyota playing a role in that, determining which technologies or companies, or is that left up to you guys? Toyota's given us a, a complete clean sheet. They're not interfering in any way. They basically said, go out, put whatever you want on it, but bring it back to us first. Let us have first shot at the technology. Toyota gets that you're first showing. crack at it. Toyota okay. gets first crack at their Who gets vehicle. the car at the end of the program? At the end of the program. Steve Rogers, uh, right? Uh, yeah, <laughs> probably not Steve. Probably, uh, probably not us. <laughs> Linda, let's talk all wheel drive. I see more and more vehicles showing up with all wheel drive, not just SUVs or trucks, it's coming into crossovers and passenger cars. All last week, when most of North America was hit by this, Arctic Vortex, as they got at it, I was in all-wheel drive vehicles. I thought they were fantastic. I know Linamar is playing a big role in that, but what are you doing to improve the fuel efficiency of all-wheel drive vehicles? Because that's been one of the things that's held it back in the past. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's been a lot of growth in all-wheel drive vehicles, which has been really exciting for us. and. Uh, we've been winning a lot of business there and certainly uh, the innovations that we've worked on have been a key part of that and, and they've, uh, they've taken place in, in a couple of different areas. I mean, another way to improve fuel efficiency outside of light weighting is through noise reduction. So if we can reduce uh, the noise uh, coming from the gear set, for instance, uh, then uh, we're, you know, reducing friction and improving fuel efficiency. So we're doing, uh, again, all kinds of innovative things in terms of process technology, uh, really innovative helical gear grinding uh, work that we're doing uh, for our all-wheel drive systems that reduce noise and improve fuel efficiency. But at the same time, we're looking at entirely new designs for uh, our driveline system. So for instance, we launched last year an electronically actuated axle. Uh, which can basically turn any vehicle into a hybrid. And because the design is, I wouldn't say plug and play, but uh, has a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to fairly easily integrate it into a variety of architectures, uh, we uh, are a, a great uh, option for companies who are trying to just drive more fuel efficiency into existing uh, architectures. And we've seen great interest from our customers uh, in the product. So let me see if I understand this right. I'm assuming this would be a front drive vehicle. Right. So you take out the rear axle, put in your electric motor with the axle in the rear, and now exactly. you've got a hybrid. Exactly, so it's creating all wheel drive uh, for, for one thing, um, but also has an electro -mo electric motor. In fact, we have two electric motors, which is part of our patented uh, technology because it's giving you the electronic drive, but also because we have one on each side, it's giving you a, a full torque vectoring to give you a lot of control and stability in terms of the drive from side to side. So you get a vehicle that's 
more fuel efficient uh, in quite a small, uh, efficient sized package, so obviously lightweight as well, with great drivability. Oh, I love this technology. When might we see this in the showrooms? Well, hopefully as soon as possible. We've got all kinds of customers uh, test driving and looking at uh, incorporating it. So, so a year uh, or two away, maybe? You, I hope have, so. Uh, okay. Sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Okay, Swami, same thing. Uh, uh, Magna's into uh, all-wheel drive systems as well, and I got to believe you're looking at similar things and in making it lighter weight as well. Yeah, uh, I think uh, all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive, I think Magna has roughly about 28% of the 7 billion market that's available, and we continue to grow. As you look at the projections, you know, we are growing at about 5% all the way up to about 20-22% in the outer years towards 2018 and 2020. Uh, one of the technologies, I think, similar to what we talked about, we have implemented with uh, Volvo, uh, is what we call the ERAD technology, which is, you know, a hybrid when needed. You know, you want to run it as a hybrid or a pure electric or, you know, combination the way you want it. Uh, there is a lot in terms of thermal management that you could look at, uh, besides light weighting to make it optimized. Uh, give power when you need it. Power is at premium right now uh, in the vehicle. You know, with all the convenience features coming in and how they're being used, anything that you can save is, you know, goes towards the savings. That's one, and obviously the other thing is a lot of farming technologies and joining technologies for all the new materials that are coming in whether it's in pumps, whether it's in casings, whether it's in gears, all that adds up uh, you know, to the light weighting portion of it. You know, years ago, if you got a vehicle with all-wheel drive, then called four-wheel drive, boy, it really decreased the fuel efficiency of the vehicle. These days, maybe you're losing one mile per gallon is what I want to say. Are we going to get to the day where maybe it's not even that kind of a penalty? I think definitely the push is there. Like I said, one of the key things is uh, how do you use power only when you need it? So the parasitic losses are reduced as much as possible. Uh, I would say it's definitely possible you know, to get to no penalty uh, on fuel and still have the features. Yeah, as an example, we've already incorporated a disconnect technology with our PTU system to do exactly that, eliminate the parasitic losses so that when you don't need the, uh, the drive in the rear, it disconnects and you know all the, those systems stop spinning and you don't have the fuel uh, issues that, that you might have in the past. So do you think we'll get to the point where if you have all-wheel drive, it's, it's a wash, you won't really see much difference in fuel efficiency? Absolutely. No kidding. How exciting. I think we're going to see a lot more all-wheel drive coming in vehicles then. Steve, let's go back to this whole uh, connected car and thing. You're working with Clemson University on some project. What's that about? Well, basically, we're trying to reach out to uh, a whole bunch of different organizations. Clemson would be a good example. Uh, they do some fairly innovative things uh, with BMW, but we're also working with Fraunhofer Institutes in Germany. We're trying to bring the best of innovation. We know in Canada, more specifically, we're not a low-cost country. We have to compete by innovation. The very things that Linda and Swami have been talking about, we have to have unique products. And if we can take advantage of all of the academic research and Clemson with the new test facility they're going to have is a great example in, bio, or in uh, composite materials, uh, light weighting and a number of different other areas. But we have to find innovation wherever we can. It's not just about what's in house at a supply it's about where is it around the world it's about convergence how do we bring it together innovation is what's going to allow us to be competitive I, I totally agree Germany's not a low-cost country either and boy they're off to the races when it comes to manufacturing what kind of guidance are you trying to provide as you look out to all this university research and and try to aggregate it in Canada. Specifically, what are you targeting? Well, we're targeting, uh, first off, very specific areas. Uh, the areas where we think we can make a difference, and we've talked about them. Light weighting, the connected car, the autonomous car, all-wheel drive, uh, driving technologies, all of those things that go into it. But we're also talking about areas of capability in Canada, biofibers, because of our vast agricultural um, uh, resources that we have, get rid of resin-based materials. What we're basically saying to the universities is what we really want to focus on is 
what our products, not, we're not interested in five and 10 years out in fairness right now. We're interested, we've got a challenge between 2016 to 2025 on fuel economy, and the autonomous car is right in that range. So what technologies have you got that are there that we could get onto a platform that we could commercialize in a three to five year time horizon to really make a difference and to help us meet fuel efficiency targets, meet drivability, meet autonomous vehicle targets. Well, to me, it's very exciting to hear all this activity that's going on in Canada. I'm glad that we're able to put a spotlight on it for you all, too. And uh, I love what I'm hearing here and lightweighting, all-wheel drive, connected cars, autonomous technology. I want to thank you all for having participated in today's panel. Our pleasure, a pleasure to, be to be here, John. Here. Thanks for having us. We're going to get our next panel ready. Don't go away just yet. And here's something else for you to take a look at while we get the next one ready. When I first started shopping for a hybrid, I didn't even look at anything else. I just assumed you went and bought a Prius. So this time around, we were able to do some research and we ended up getting a Ford, which we love. It's been a wonderful switch. It has everything that you could want in the car. It's the most fun to drive because of the acceleration of the car. If you can get someone to test drive a C-Max, they would end up buying this more times than not. Make the switch to C-Max Hybrid. Get 0% financing for 60 months and $1,000 switch bonus cash. See your local Ford dealer today. Joining me right now is Chuck Evans, the Corporate Vice President and General Manager of Hankel. Great to be talking with you, Chuck. And great to be here. Thank you. Hankel, of course, makes structural adhesives. The automotive industry is in this mad scramble right now to take weight, to take mass out of cars, to improve fuel economy. Mm -hmm. But explain, how does structural adhesives play a role in that? Well, it's not only structural adhesives. It's, it's surface treatments of, of all kinds. So, but think about it. Classically, we make a car out of steel. So you learn how to treat steel, you, you learn how to join steel, and life is good. Now with the quest to try to take weight out of a car, you have to look for new and innovative materials. Some of those might be aluminum, some could be carbon fiber, some are high strength steel, which, which are much thinner gauge. So they all take a different process to manufacture those substrates, and then you gotta figure out how to join them. So classic ways of joining no longer uh, will work. Can't spot weld you carbon fiber. <laughs> and what better way than to have a continuous bead that does a lot more than just join the materials. It helps corrosion protection, and it also helps quiet the car. Are you seeing a greater increase from uh, automakers in, in using structural adhesives? Yes, I mean, auto, the structural adhesives have um, increased in their use over the last 10 years, and you found even recently, they're increasing at an increasing rate. Uh, the interesting thing, it's not one size fits all, because everybody manufactures a substrate a little bit differently. They have surface uh, different treatments and coatings, and whatnot, so the development of structural adhesives is, is kind of a boutique um, uh, approach to building a car. Every substrate needs to have an adhesive designed specifically for it. Is this a global trend? Are you seeing this around the world? And is Henkel able to step up to doing this on a global basis? Well, uh, I'll take the last part of the question first. And uh, one of our one of our real assets and and, um, and value propositions is our global reach. We are everywhere where they're manufacturing components or they're manufacturing vehicles. The answer to your question about structural adhesives, yes, it is a, absolutely a global phenomena, but it is stronger in some OEMs than in others. And for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to get into right now, but it's, it's, it's catching on with pretty much everyone. There's so many new cars coming out these days. I imagine that if a car company that is not used much in terms of structural adhesives wants to start using it, that's going to add more lines or more space in the manufacturing area. How does that play a role? And with all these launches coming, how do you see this going off seamlessly? So, so one, of, one of the key um, criteria for us to be successful in replacing welds, for example, <clears throat> would be to make sure that the design and development of an adhesive is done flawlessly such that the chief engineer of a new vehicle can sleep at night knowing that the chemical operation that's going to join all these dissimilar materials has been well vetted long before SOP. So when the design freeze happens, the APQP is completely done, everything is PPAPed, and you've got an innovative material that's been proven to be robust. So uh, where uh, in the car exactly are these adhesives being used? They're pretty much being used all around the vehicle. I mean, you, we have adhesives that are used in powertrain. 
You know, we're, we're bonding uh, and, and replacing uh, gaskets, uh, for example. Where retaining compounds can be argued that they're, they're also an adhesive. So the, the whole family of adhesives from, from semi-structural to impact resistant adhesives are being used uh, all around the vehicle. When we talk about impact resistant, though, you're looking at the frame and you're looking at, you know, bonding stru uh, structural components to the frame. And I've got to imagine, too, that uh, it gives the uh, the designers, the design engineers, more flexibility in being able to bond pieces together rather than having to weld them together. Well, I mean, I think that's obviously the weight savings is the primary um, uh, focus right now. And then you would have corrosion resistance. And then you've got design flexibility, as you just mentioned. And when you bundle all three of those things, it becomes a pretty powerful value proposition to go ahead and switch from, you know, all this capital intensive welding operations to dispensing an adhesive. You mentioned corrosion protection. How does that play a role? Well, I mean, Obviously, aluminum, uh, you know, corrodes in a different um, fashion than steel does. So the, the aluminum sheet has to be protected. And then when you put a bond of adhesive between uh, aluminum and steel, you, you have a cured uh, bead here that acts as a barrier for electron transfer. So those electrons actually don't emanate corrosion, and you've now created a, a corrosion-free uh, path. It eliminates that galvanic corrosion exactly. that takes place. Exactly. And uh, your outlook for how this is going to go, uh, you say the rate of uh, increase is increasing, you, you must be pretty bullish about it. I'm very bullish about it. And I think the three things that, uh, you know, that we've got at our doorstep as an industry, and I think that plays right into the hands of, of Henkel, are, are the fact that light weighting and sustainability is, is here and it's here to stay, that global reach and global design of platforms is here and it's here to stay, and that, that the ability for um, us as parts and chemical suppliers to flawlessly launch anywhere in the world is here and it's here today. Chuck Evans, thanks for bringing us up to speed and Henkel's role in all this. John, thanks for having me. Welcome back to the AutoLine Supplier Symposium, coming to you live from the floor of the 2014 North American International Auto Show at the Ford Display, where everybody's here looking at the shiny new models and taking in the rest of the show. This next panel discussion was put together by Inforum, a professional organization for women. We got a great title for this. The easy part of this business is over now. What's coming next? And what we mean by that is, from the Great Recession to now, this auto industry has seen nothing but torrid growth, at least here in North America. But what's next? And to help figure that out, I've got three executives with me, including Olga Alavanu, the Executive Vice President of the US OEM Business Unit at Yazaki, Andrika Nectarline, the Vice President of Global Sales for Lear Corporation's Electrical Division. We gotta emphasize that. Everybody knows that Lear does seats and interior things. They also have electric and electronic, and we'll be getting into that with Andrika. We also have Sandy Stoikovsky, the president of Scenaria, in case you haven't heard of Scenaria. It's a member of the AVL group. It's a management consulting firm that uses, or I should say, specializes in product and technology planning, using big data, deep specialist planning, technological expertise to help make help companies make sane and good investments in those things. And I hope I described the, the company relatively well there, Sam. You did great. Thank okay. you, John. <laughs> <laughs> Olga, let me start with you. We've seen tremendous growth here from the big collapse in 2008. We closed out 2013, 15.4 million, some say 15.5, depending on how you're, you're counting them. What do you see now? It, it, so, so like you said, John, um, with the recovery of the economy, the recovery of our industry, we all had to react very fast. We all had to uh, jump in, find solutions. Uh, we added capacity, we added shifts, we uh, struggled to hire engineers. We at Yazaki were about almost complete, I would say about 70% complete with our recovery plans. So now finally it's time for us to Take, have some room to breathe. Actually, it's time that we can say, yes, we can meet our current capacity. Actually, we have some room to grow. And the reason for that is because when we put our recovery plans together, we do so, of course, focusing on our, on our short-term issues because we had to, we had to survive. But at the same time, we were very mindful of our long-term strategy. 
and how this strategy is going to determine our future, how this strategy is going to uh, focus on, on, on what, uh, what is in the future for us. So with that said, um, we uh, feel now that we are comfortable. We still have discussions internally to make sure that we plan appropriately, but we do certainly see a much more stable outlook. And with that stable outlook, we know now it's time to say, okay, enough. We need to stop reacting and go back to planning. And, and this is our exciting times for us because with that, we know that what's important is we continue to strengthen the relationships with our key customers. We need to better align with those customers because it's extremely important together to decide where this growth is going to come from. So internally at Yazaki, when we talk about growth, of course we need to focus on what the, what are the traditional ways of, of growth? So we're still looking at, uh, of course, growing at emerging markets. We are still looking at new customers, some of them new to Yazaki, some of them new to global markets. But at the end of the day, we do believe that the biggest opportunity, the biggest potential for growth for us will come from new technologies. So the question, of course, is what these new technologies will be? And, and more importantly, what is that vision of that future vehicle? And, and we do believe that the world and that future vehicle will be much more linked. We do believe that the world, the, the society's infrastructure and that future vehicle will be much more connected. And, and us as an electronics and, and, and electrical and distribution supplier, we are actually um, excited to be able to offer connectivity solutions to our customers. Um, also, of course, lots of discussion these days on autonomous vehicle. So we definitely see this on the horizon. The question with that is the end buyer, how the end buyer is going to react to these cutting edge technologies. And more importantly, will the end buyer be willing to pay for these technologies? That for us remains to be seen. Yeah, it sure does. Andrika, same question. We've seen this torrid growth. Probably the growth is not going to be as great. How do you plan to deal with this at Lear? I mean, we really do see a lot of growth in the electrical electronics area. And it's because of all these features and content that they're adding on vehicles. And it's really driven by things like safety. There is a demand for safety in the vehicles. And we're seeing features like um, adaptive cruise control and blind spot detection systems and collision avoidance systems that were on high-end luxury vehicles that are now becoming standard equipment or you're seeing them on mainstream vehicles. And they're going to be on these autonomous vehicles that Olga referenced in the next 10 years. Um, we're also seeing growth because of the connected vehicle, the, the connected car. And there's been so much growth in the area of infotainment and navigation, but what we're going to start seeing now is growth in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. For example, a smart traffic light that's connected to your vehicle. And we're still seeing a lot of growth because of the fuel efficiency standards that are government mandated. So we see a lot of growth in the electrified vehicle segment still in plug-in hybrids and hybrid electric vehicles. And one of the things that Olga alluded to was working closely with the OEMs because with all these features and content that are being added, you have to make room for them. And you have to be really aware of weight in the vehicle because of the fuel standards. You've got to be aware of packaging size. So we do a lot of things up front collaboratively with the OEMs to try to find ways to take out the weight and to reduce packaging size. Okay, Sandy, now I got to get to you because you tend to sit back and look at the whole universe of things. Here we've got Olga and Andrika talking about they need to get into new products, new technology. What advice do you have for companies, supplier companies that have got to go through this? Absolutely. I mean, this is a, a tremendous opportunity that all the suppliers are faced with to grow and to really grow because of some really technology transforming trends that are driving the industry. CO2 reduction globally is a huge opportunity, as is the consumer interest and value in connectedness of various forms. So you have connectedness and CO2 coming together really to converge on things electrified is really where you see when you look at both of those trends coming together. So it's a great opportunity, but it's also a huge risk because the cost of playing in that field is really large. And you've started to see some companies go out of certain businesses or shed assets to free up cash to spend on those technologies. So that the visibility of the picture that we have from all the people we're privileged to work with is 
looking at how do you gain confidence on the right technologies because everybody's got to invest in technology so as not to be a commodity in the future. So what are you going to invest in? And you know, the, in the past, I think our industry really looked in the rear view, rear view mirror for data and saying what used to happen. They'd use their golden guts to really make decisions on priorities for consumers. And frankly, they'd use five smart guys in a room to try to decide how to put a plan together based on that rear view mirror and those golden guts. And this is just so complex, all the data, all the technologies, how fast it's moving, and all the uncertainty that we're facing, that, that those three things just don't work anymore. And um, so our view is really getting people confidence using you know, the best of the data they can gain, the best of models, the best of technologies. Okay, so how would you advise Olga and Andrika how they should proceed with what they were talking about? Well, you know, certainly as you're looking at electrification, you know, there are um, electrifications going to prosper is how we see it. But the question is really what, what kinds of electrification are going to provide, you know, sustainable growth and sustainable competitive advantage. And so, you know, our, our fundamental premise when we're helping people diagnose their planning processes and things is first and foremost, you've got to be able to compare what you're considering to everything else your customers have at their disposal. So getting a, your own viewpoint of the customer's perspective is the number one thing that we help people do and what I would absolutely uh, advise if you're not already doing that to really uh, find a way to do that. Yeah. It all, all gets back to the customer, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And also you mentioned that you have, uh, e even with all the turmoil and everything, if I understood you right, Olga, you said you have something like 30% capacity that you can grow into? Definitely, yes. And what I was saying, John, before is that obviously when we first entered the recovery period, we definitely struggled. We struggled to bring capacity quick enough, but um, at the time we, we thought, okay, we need to do that to survive, but then what, what, what's happening afterwards? So yes, we are planning to have some extra capacity in order to meet our customer needs for the future. Not a lot of extra capacity, because obviously we don't want to do that, but it's always good to plan for the future. So we are excited to be able in a po to be in a position right now to actually look at the future and be better prepared for the future. So capacity is there. We still obviously, big question for all of us is engineering resources, right? We, we, we talk a lot about that. Like I said before, we struggle to hire engineers. We are still in a mode of competing for engineers. It's amazing sometimes to think that we live in a state that we have the highest concentration of engineers in, in the country and still we struggle. We still fight the engineering uh, war. We, we, we fight for talent. Um, we're doing all kinds of things to prepare for it, to make sure that we have the resources available for the future. Because obviously, as, as Andrika and Stacy said before, we can't get into these new technologies. We can't develop these new technologies if we don't have the appropriate talent in our organization, extremely important for us. Um, lots of initiatives within the company to make sure we secure that talent for our future. Andrika, how do you deal with this? I mean, I hear this from everyone in the supplier community. We cannot get the talent or the numbers of, of talent that we need. You know, it's definitely an issue, especially in the area of software capability with the connected vehicle and all the things we're talking about. There's a real demand for software engineers. And it's not only in our industry, but really it's outside automotive too, because everything is now connected. So if anyone has a, anyone in college, steer them towards software engineering because you're guaranteed a job. But um, it, it is something that we've been working on. We made a conscious effort a couple years ago to really focus on becoming an employer of choice, to attract talent and to keep talent. Because in this type of industry that's growing so much in the electrification area, it is something that we are focused on. and. Um, it, it's not easy. I, I got to believe this new technology that we're talking about, connectivity, autonomous cars, electrification, that's exciting stuff. You would think that that would bring people into this industry, and I'm hoping, fingers crossed, would bring more women in as well. 
Well, it's definitely my experience that when people know that you're working on CO2 reduction and connectivity and autonomous type vehicles and new technology, that is very attractive to people to want to get into the industry. I think the issue right now is kind of of a short-term nature. Even short-term thinking in the past has led to somewhat of a decrease in the amount of people to really draw from. So as we really look at growth, we don't need to just look at growth and technologies. We need to think longer term about resources and strategic re relationships you know that go into earlier time frames within the student body as well as other types of relationships that can help us meet those needs but just get more strategic <laughs> we have a very exciting industry I think yeah. and and I wish the young people see that and realize that we, we do the best we can to talk to them to get them more exposure and what we do every day uh, for a living uh, it's an extremely exciting industry but like I said we are competing we are competing with the Googles out there and we um, still there is an impression with the young people that we are a, a conservative and inflexible if you will industry and, and we all know that that's not necessarily true it's very exciting industry lots of technologies opportunity to growth global exposure um, hoping that um, the young people will will see that about us does the auto industry need to do a better job of selling itself it does a great job of selling cars trucks and vans and crossovers what about selling the industry is a great place to come work yeah. it's true it's true. I think it is becoming more appealing though to some of the younger people um, when they see all these cool things on vehicles and they see that it's connected so I think it is becoming more appealing and Maybe now we can start to compete against the Googles and the other Silicon Valley companies, but but definitely we should market it more and, and make it more appealing. And I, you know, some of the things I think that all our companies try to do is to try to get into some of the high schools and get into some programs where you're working with high school kids and getting them exposure to the industry so that it is something that sounds appealing to them. That's actually a very good point that Andrika is bringing because we are focusing on college students up to now. We, that's what we have done. And, and we are talking to them, we are trying to get them engineering students to, to get them to be interested in the automotive industry, but I think we're not doing such a good job with the high school students, like she said. I think that's where the opportunity is. That's when you talk to them and you get them interested in engineering school. Well, the educators tell me that's even too late. You got to start at middle school, and so I'm sure somebody out there will say so even grade school. Okay, Sandy, last thoughts on this topic. You're the strategic thinker. How does the industry go out and create a plan of bringing young people in and finding that this is an exciting industry? Well, as like most problems in our industry, or, or opportunities in this case, uh, it's a complex issue and there's no silver bullets that are going to solve this. And there's been a lot of great momentum towards getting the word out on what auto can do and a lot more to come that I'm really enthusiastic as I see the industry. Um, you know, I think there's a lot that can still be done to really help people understand what does a career path in the auto industry look like, not just an entry level job, uh, but that type of thing. And those are just some of the types of ideas. So I think it's really going to take a coming together of multiple kinds of stakeholders and trying to get a view of this problem that's in front of us. It's not just now, it's going to continue and trying to really get a systems view of this complex problem as usual. <laughs> so you just said the right thing complex view of this systems issue. So yeah, I, there is no silver bullet or it would have been used already. Yep. Hey, I want to thank all three of you for having come on. Uh, Olga Alavanu from uh, Yozaki, Andrika Nectarline from Lear and Sandy Stoikovsky from Scenaria. I want to thank Inforum for putting this panel together. Thank, thank you, you all. John. Thank you. We're going to wrap up in just a minute. I'll be back with some closing thoughts. Sit tight. The Auto Line Supplier Symposium is brought to you by our signature sponsor, Ford Motor Company, Go Further, and also by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion. Henkel, excellence is our passion. IAC Group, inspiration comes from within. And TI Automotive, fluid thinking. This wraps up the AutoLine Supplier Symposium. Hey, we just had that panel from Inforum. I want to remind you that Friday morning, they've got a terrific webcast that you'll be able to look out. They've got Mark Field speaking at their breakfast down here at the Auto Show as well. Check that out. Check out Inforum's uh, webcast coming live from the Detroit Auto Show with Mark Fields from the Ford Motor Company. In any case, 
I truly hope that you enjoyed this supplier symposium. Remember, this is only day one. We're coming back here tomorrow. We've got a terrific lineup of panels that are getting into a bunch of other issues that are affecting the supplier industry. But for now, John McElroy signing off for the AutoLine Supplier Symposium.